Welcome to the Web to Mine Compute presentation. Um, uh, quick introduction, my name is Nemanja. I'm just your like, regular software developer. A bunch of links there um, where you can please not contact me. And uh, <laughs> um, been work working with work for about a year in a Web3 mine, but um, we did quite a few years before that work together and different stuff. So um, let's uh, see what we are going to cover today. So um, what I'm going to talk about is first how this uh, Web3 mine approach to compute actually works. Uh, how do we abstract the jobs and the workloads and then I'm gonna explain a bit about our market and how we keep all the jobs and uh, actually give possibility to uh, miners to, when I say miners, I mean like compute providers to actually execute some stuff and get rewarded for that and uh, all the way while I'm talking about this, I'm gonna explain on a specific use case of ceiling as a service and how we actually uh, specialize our compute framework for uh, ceiling. And then I'm going to do a bit of demo to show you how it actually works. So um, first, let's try and understand what is a job. So we have some pool of some jobs. And job represents one unit uh, of workload that some executor can actually do so um, and the output of that job should be verified however uh, in this case we are not trying to solve the uh, verification ourselves as a network so we are relying on the network to actually have its own way of verifying uh, if outputs are correct for example here we have some like uh, file coin ceiling jobs like PC1 PC2 C2 we have some live peer and those are different networks. Like we have a Filecoin, we have a live peer network. We can add like uh, I don't know, like Fluence, Lillipad, any compute network can uh, join this pool, and uh, some miners can actually join and uh, execute those jobs and pull them from the side. But however, if you were, for example, uh, let's actually move to yeah, so. If you over some specific uh, worker that's gonna execute a specific job, uh, for example, ceiling worker, so the verification is already solved by the Filecoin network, so that is something that we are relying on. We can by ourselves execute the verification in a similar way, but uh, we are not providing the way for you to actually generate like arbitrary workloads and uh, verify them. So um, every job is defined by its inputs. So input plus what the job is, what's its workload, actually uniquely identifies that job. Um, so two jobs, two PC jobs with different inputs, obviously, is uh, produce a different output. And um, so uh, executors can join the network, and they can request jobs. Uh, that they know how to execute, and they can produce their outputs. So that is very simple, basic stuff there. We have a PC1, it executes a PC1 job, and it produced the, actually, the Komar, it's a comd. But um, yeah, and verification uh, is done by the actual Filecoin network. So um, on the other side, we need a uh, demand for the compute and we have a compute client in the Falcon case it's the storage provider and that is the entity that is actually responsible for generating a job so storage provider is the one that says hey I need this sector to be sealed and it generates the whole bunch of jobs but here I only show the PC one and then it waits for the output and at some point, some worker in the network will get that job, execute it, submit the output, and the storage provider is happy. Um, or if it doesn't get the job, it's not happy. And then it's gonna complain. So um, this was like overview of what a job by itself is, but job just looking at that atomic level, 
does not really represent anything useful. It needs to be combine, combined with other jobs in order to um, to actually do something that makes sense for some specific use case. In the case of ceiling, we have many different jobs that together uh, actually produce what is needed for that network, and that is like the seal sector and the proof. Um, and in this case, we have like PC1, then we have a PC2, C1, C2, and they're all connected and dependent on the previous jobs to be executed in order for next to be executed. So if we have had different workers that all of them can ask for ask for a different job, but for in this case, simply even if the job is there because it does not have the input PC to worker, for example, here would not get it. But at the moment when the PC1 gets finished, and then um, the PC2 would be able to uh, start executing and some worker can actually fetch it. Um, so, however, like the ceiling is not, like the way we designed this uh, for you to actually create those workloads <laughs> gives you a lot of flexibility. So you can actually go into a bit more details and design your workloads in a way that actually gives you a uh, possibility to do a different stuff. So if we go into a ceiling in a bit more details, um, we can actually simulate it like this. So we have a bit more details. So we have, for example, the PC1. It needs a storage provider ID, it needs a sector ID, and it needs a ticket as an input. However, like, um, if we used this representation of ceiling and we added like this whole workload to uh, the pool of the jobs, then we would need to generate a ticket right in the beginning, right? And then, which means that someone would need to pick up the job and execute it in the next 24 hours so the ticket would expire, right? So uh, that actually does not give the storage provider opportunity to just create the job and be okay with it to be executed at some later point. Um, so this job, if nobody picks it, would just expire and the storage provider would get probably mad, you know? So, but in this case, you can actually present that part also as a job. And then you can just create this whole thing and just let it sit there. And whenever someone picks it up, then the worker will generate the ticket and then start executing the later stages. And also, like, if we think about PC2, like, what is the output of the PC2? It's not just the... Com D, Com R, it's also a whole CL sector, right? 32 gigabytes of CL sector. And that needs to be moved somehow to the storage provider. And that can be also described as a job. So we have a transfer job, for example, here. So then we have a C1 that actually needs a seed, right? It cannot just receive, it cannot be executed immediately after the PC2, or it can in a different kind of proofs where you do different kind of seed generation, but in just the regular case, like, this is a job also. It's a pretty dumb job because, like, it just picks up the output of this and wait for one hour and, like, 15 minutes and then just picks up the randomness and continues. Um, so this is a bit more detailed approach to simulate the ceiling workload. We actually, like in our case, uh, did both. We started with this, then we realized we can actually make it more detailed. And uh, so our goal is to actually provide everyone possibility to design the workloads really easily and create these compute graphs um, with a really ergonomic way. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you look at this, it's pretty colorful. And in theory, yeah, you could have um, many different workers that execute, that each of them is responsible for executing one specific job. But in this use case, it does not really make sense because the cache data between these phases is uh, pretty big. It's like 500 gigabytes. So it does not really make sense to split it in that way. So what we also uh, are designing is a way for executors to actually ask for, ask for a specific subgraph of this compute graph. For example, 
executor can say, hey, give me PC1, PC2, wait C, C1, all that, give me just that sub part of this computer. I'm gonna do everything there and submit results of that. And then the later stage that is dependent on that output can continue. So um, we can look at it like that. So um, for example, we can have a PC1, PC2, C1 worker. I don't know how to call it better. Um, that can actually say, hey, give me this thing. And all of, or some an am amount of jobs with this particular configuration will be given to this worker and then this worker would execute them and submit the results of that and then all of those workloads that uh, for which this sub part was executed will then be able to continue with the later stages. So essentially what happens now is that storage provider create this whole thing when uh, it needs sealing to happen and uh, then the, it does not care in which way the executors do it. But executor can actually ask themselves in any way they want. And this part is also interesting. So in a storage provider, after it creates this job, it only waits for the transfer job. So it will be the one that actually executed. So the job is not something that only compute providers do. So any entity that joins the network can have responsibility for execution of specific jobs. So it waits for the transfer because it needs to fetch the sector and keep it, and it also waits for the output to C2 to get the, to get the proof. Um, and uh, so, uh, this is probably something wrong. Okay, and another way to actually uh, use this, um, to use those compute graphs is to actually, for example, substitute the wait seed and generate ticket jobs with the actual constants. So for example, if we do a disaster recovery, we don't want to generate new ticket, we don't want to do new wait seed. So we can just create a, a workload that has this constant value and uh, let the workers execute them. And essentially what we did is reseal the sector. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's a way that you could do a disaster recovery. So there are many different ways that you can combine things however you see fit. Um, and that is uh, what we are aiming for with this. And all the different networks, whatever like jobs that they have, they could arrange them in any way, submit them, and then like wait for any of the compute providers that also attach to our network to execute them. Um, and this is essentially how it looks like. So we have a market of jobs and we have on one side the uh, demand of the demand for the jobs, which is compute clients, in this case storage providers, to generate all those jobs whenever they need sectors to be sealed. And on the other side we have compute providers or like C2 workers, PC2 workers they just um, request jobs from there and execute them and submit the result. And they do not care for whom they, they are doing that. They can care if they wanna have a deal with specific storage provider, but in like the more general case, just they are just attached to the network, register there and start executing and get rewarded, get paid for that. Um, so, um, everybody can register there. I'm going to show you the market, how it looks like at the end, and uh, see how it actually works. Um, so this was all like the general talk about how these jobs are designed, how you can use them, how you can arrange them, uh, and everything was shown in a ceiling as a specific use case of that, uh, which should which is a first use case, uh, and we are looking forward for many new use cases, for many new networks. Um, and the next thing I'm gonna show you is actually how we integrated that. So if you were a network, for example, like a Filecoin is, and uh, how you can integrate with our market. And for this use case, we use the Ceiling as a Service API on the Lotus. And we introduced another component, we call it Relay, 
that actually orchestrates between the Lotus Stealing as a Service API and the Web2 Mine market. And um, it exposes a really simple interface to the storage provider, which just says, hey, I want to commit this much capacity. And then the relay is responsible for communicating with the Lotus, for creating jobs on the market, polling results of that, transferring the sectors, and orchestrating everything between them, um, which greatly simplifies the flow on the storage provider side. <coughs> And we aim for actually giving the most like one click button solution to storage providers to just onboard data. And this is one step closer to that. Um, on, the other on the other side, we have the compute. So we provided the uh, Web3 compute uh, solution, uh, which includes for now ceiling implementations. It contains the regular. Uh, uh, Filecoin proving subsystem implementation that Lotus is using, but we also integrated the supranational ceiling uh, software, and uh, you can use that and register on the market and then just start sealing the jobs that are there and waiting to be executed. Um, and essentially then the picture looks like this. On one side you have a storage provider that just wants to commit capacity. It goes to the market and the uh, compute providers just attach to the market and do jobs. They don't care about anything else. Just get a job executed and submit result. However, there are many different configurations. You can just simply attach to the market and execute, but you can, uh, if you want, to actually compute your uh, to connect your compute provider to a specific storage provider ID. So for example, we give you the possibility to have a job queue that's going to be connected directly to a specific relay of the specific storage provider and arrange them in a different configuration. In this example, uh, we have a configuration where the queue, the local queue, accepts the PC1, PC2, and C1 jobs, and we have uh, C2 jobs that are sent to the market, and in that way, so you can, for example, use supranational sealer, execute bunch of, bunch of jobs, and let the market handle the C2 jobs if you don't want to uh, keep that compute with yourself. Um, and this is uh, probably not something that we're going to go and look up in the details. You can look up that uh, on our documentation, but it essentially shows the detailed flow and really deep technical sequential diagram of which API is getting called, how it goes with this particular configuration. Um, and yeah, essentially there is a storage provider run side, there is a market, here is a queue and a local sealer and there is a C2 somewhere that is connected to the market. I, I, it's, it, I don't know half the stuff that these guys are doing, but uh, I think it's kind of important to recognize that we had one pressing orchestration problem as we de uh, decompose or de disaggregate the existing Lotus structures. This was the first compute job that had to be solved. But everything I'm watching these guys doing, I'm astounded. This state di diagram that's going on, the interaction diagram between various state levels involved with disaggregating the Lotus stack as it is today, this same basic technology could be applied to any generalized compute prog uh, problem for which you needed the proof of, of verifiable work in the context of some stored object. So while Nemanja's been deep diving on this, this framework is so powerful. It is enabling for so many other things. And this is just one concrete use case where we were able to disaggregate the Lotus stack in such a way that these modules, these modular functionalities can be broken apart. And these guys have been able to put it together in a generic put it back together in a generic way that can be dis disaggregated and distributed across the planet against any service providers that want to specialize on one particular aspect of that of that task. This same template could be applied for other gen uh, to other generic compute solutions. Is this like <clears throat> with FVM, I guess if you're using Lotus and you're using for at least for the verification verification a lot of the Falcon native actors, right? Like or and then I'm I'm curious like for with with like the other things that we had like 
with Lilypad and Bakaria, who are also working on basically like these determin I don't know if these are deterministic, but they also have like these modules of compute jobs that are running deterministic so that verification works or something. I'm like, is, is this doesn't feel so dissimilar? Is it just like a very particular? Is it like the disaggregation of what Lotus does? Or like how how is it different or similar? Uh, so ultimately, in every compute network, you're going to have a compute job, and you have you need to have a way to verify that job. Uh, for that, you need to understand that uh, whether the job is always executed in the same exact way. If it's not, it cannot be verified. Like you can use uh, other things to execute the job, but it is not a deterministic job. So th that's true for like uh, every network. So uh, now. I'm not sure about uh, what Lilypad specifically is doing today, other than like the AI workloads that do like. Uh, uh, it's just AI workloads. Yeah, probably it's going to be like more workloads, but ultimately at the end of the day, like what you're going to see across all the ecosystems is like a pool of research, and then you'll see like the particular workloads, and then you'll have like a layer of incentives. So all of those are going to be interacting between each other. So you can have Lilypad have its own economy and you can have like the interaction with that economy through something like a web tree mine and have like a group of providers that have a particular resource that can actually execute uh, the workload that present on those networks. In a similar way, you can have this ne network executing Lilypad, Liper, uh, C-Link, which is Filecoin, and then you can have like other jobs like Jensen and like a bunch of other. But ultimately, yeah, you have a job and you have a way to determine whether the job was executed or not through the validation process. And we are always going to rely on the validation of those networks. So in the case of Lilypad, we would rely on the validation, which in the case of Lilypad is more like a incentive structure, but that is the validation that, that you trust because you are executing a job from that network. Yeah, essentially we do not try to solve that problem by ourselves. We are relying and we are just aggregating other networks into a bigger thing. Um, yeah, um, so uh, another thing that we also uh, did, just to simplify things for everyone, um, if someone wants to try really easily out of the box to just seal stuff remotely for a specific miner, we did e a integration of a sealing as a service directly, so you can just spawn a sealer daemon that connects directly to the market and does the ceiling, it works for the regular implementation, it works for the supranational implementation. However, there are lots of limitations there because they do communicate directly. For example, Sealer Demon <laughs> needs an access to the admin token in order to communicate with the APIs, which makes it useful only in the local scenarios because nobody would, probably nobody would give uh, some random Sealer their admin token. Uh, however, it does uh, provide an interface similar to the way the workers are currently uh, done on the Lotus. So you can just spawn a daemon that's going to be somewhere and do the ceiling uh, using like more new implementations like a supranational or something like that. Um, and uh, this is another diagram that shows how the this direct communication with the SAS works and. Uh, Oh, and that's that's it regarding the the presentation. When I uh, say something, yeah, we are out of time. Yeah, but uh, you have a couple of minutes if you want to do the demo. Yeah, okay, uh, gonna be super fast. Um, how do you price this all? Ask the price person. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I'm just a technical guy. Ultimately, here, like. Uh, in the context of Falcon was a bit different because like uh, you're capturing value from actually that sector being online. So like uh, you're actually getting block rewards on one side by the sector sending window post to the network. And then you need to understand what is your cost structure for the different uh, like uh, jobs that are being executed in order to get to that final state of the seal sector that is being proved to the network. So uh, yeah, like uh, there are many details there that uh, we can go over like one more. Really fast. Um, okay. Yeah, we can. <laughs> you want to hold it here? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, here, if you want to uh, join the market and start sealing, 
you simply need to go to our marketplace, you log in with your Discord, you need to join our Discord channel, link is there on the page for the authentication, and you will be presented with the overview of all your ceiling instances and the jobs that they executed. Um, so I'm currently, I currently added one C2. I mean, I have a bunch of them, but I'm gonna show you the flow that you're gonna add your own. So there are a bunch of jobs that are being executed, a bunch of instances, so you can see here. Um, however, if I wanted to add an instance, uh, you would get the flow here, and uh, you just use an OTP code. You get an OTP code that you enter to your um, sealer. So here I'm gonna do a registration of sealer. I'm gonna add it here, enter the OTP code, and then my sealer is registered. So um, here it should be listed as a new instance. Um, so let's see. Oh, I entered. Can you zoom program. your screen? Oh yes, of course. So if I enter the new instance that I've created, there are no jobs currently executing. But now I'm gonna start asking for the jobs. But before that, we actually have one miner that have lots of jobs that are added to the market. Can, can you zoom again? So So yeah, there are a bunch of jobs that are waiting to be uh, executed um, only for the commit stage. And um, you can also see that specific miner here on the Filfox also. It has currently 2,667 totally sectors with a little bit less active right now. And um, so you are going to see how actually sectors start ch changing to available state and how they start appearing here uh, in the messages, commit messages will start appearing and the numbers will going to stop changing. So, and you will also see them in your like market portal where you can manage all your jobs and all your instances. So I've added the uh, HTOP and just like uh, NVIDIA SMA view just so you can look at how the resources are being consumed. Um, so here we can say, for example, I'm gonna ask for a batches of, I don't know, let's say four jobs. And um, now I've got the jobs, and if we swap to these, um, okay, if we go to our instance, something, Demogods. Demogods, yeah. <laughs> okay, here they are. So we see our jobs that are in progress. And um, if we look at here, it should start it. So the sector ID 6079 started executing, and here it is. Uh, yeah. So the C2 with Supranational takes just around two and a half minutes. So pretty fast, we will be seeing this job being done. We will see it change here, change the state here, and we will also see it on the storage provider, and we will also see a message in a chain. So uh, while this is executing, so are there any questions? Is, is that your gaming uh, computer? Well, it's not mine, but I wish I had this gaming <laughs> computer. It has a 3019s, so. <laughs> Two of them, but um, it seems that Zoom and NVIDIA SMI does not really go well together. I'm gonna zoom out a bit. Yeah, so here they are. And yeah, the output says the super seal is being used. And all of those sectors on the miner, they're also being sealed by the uh, super seal uh, NVMe configuration. So it does really good job of uh, sealing huge amount of sectors, really cheap and like really fast regarding how many you can actually execute in parallel. You can go like up to 128 sectors in parallel in like around 
six hours or something like that. And we got the proof, so we can see the GPU start kicking in. And in around 30 seconds, this C2 job will be finished. And we will see the next stages of the flow. More questions? Yes? Could you share what's the technical yes. stack behind the worker, for example? It's, uh, well, depends. For our worker, we did everything in Rust, but, um, and we are directly communicating with a file coin proving subsystem for the ceiling because it's also written in Rust. We just import those crates. But uh, for the supranational, it's written in C. We are building that using their own way of building, and then we are linking the uh, static libraries into our Rust, and just then communicating with uh, with their functionalities. Thanks. So this one got finished, and we can see here that it's executed. So it's 2079, and uh, here. Uh, Maybe well, let's grab it. Uh, 71 or 9? What was it? 71. 71, okay. I have a tendency to uh, always say 9 for many different numbers that are not 9. <laughs> uh, so it not, it's not yet aware. Let's watch it. Uh, uh. Uh, I think I saw another hand somewhere. I can't remember where. <laughs> uh, so, uh, are you waiting for the message to be sent, or like, what are you waiting for? Yeah, like just uh, uh, for Lotus uh, to for the relay to fetch the results from the market, and then to actually send the message to the chain. But we don't need to like if you're out of time. Maybe we can just skip that part. Uh, 